Okay, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I've got my tea. I haven't drunk it yet, so um, I've brought it with me. Now, we before I hand over to Blessing, who's going to be chairing the next session, um, I'd like to draw to your attention that we are doing some um, further work um, on top of this workshop. And we're hoping that you would want to be a part of this. Um, so what we're going to be doing um, is posting two links in the chat. One is to um, a form that will enable us to contact you subsequently if you're interested in participating in a more detailed one-to-one -one or focus group discussion um, about some of these issues. Um, this will help um, the African CDC you know, formulate um, a model or a better plan for integrating different disciplines um, at the coalface, so where you are in, in, on the front line. We'll also be sharing a link to, the, to a survey. So even if you don't want to take part in any interviews or any sort of any focus group um, discussions, um, it would take only about five minutes or so to complete this, this survey. So um, Sarah, if you could please yeah. um, share. Just, yes, I've just shared both the links on the chat. Thank you. Thank you. And so please feel free to, um, to complete those um, at any point in your own um, time. Um, I'd now like to hand over to Blessing again, who's managed to, to reconnect. I hope we haven't yeah, lost you. Thanks, Sarah, and apologies for being disconnected earlier on. Um, so yes, um, moving along um, our next session, which I hope will be the last session, I think according to the agenda, uh, is we're trying to attempt to answer the question, when is primary research? How can theories be used and local knowledge harnessed? So to help us answer or unpack this topic, we will be hearing from three speakers who would share a different uh, perspective around this topic. So our first I'd like to invite is Lucien Tauber, who is a research associate at the African School of Economics and a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute for Gender and Economy at the University of Toronto. She graduated from the University of Montreal with a PhD in economics. Before starting a doctoral study, she worked for the government in Cameroon as a senior economist. And their current research interests lie in better understanding the importance of local culture in gender norms, particularly in law and in middle income countries. So without further ado, I'd like to invite you, Lucien, and over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Blessing. So I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, yeah. OK. So can you see my screen? OK. So, um, so to open this discussion, so I'm gonna be like, uh, I'm gonna be um, presenting an ongoing work on the impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic on um, in, in Benin. So uh, this work uh, is funded by IDRC Canada. And in this project, we try to examine the, the short-term impact of COVID-19 pandemic and government response on individual socioeconomic condition. So, um, so yeah, um, what we do know, we, we all know that uh, COVID-19 has changed the world and our way of living since 2020. So several measures have been taken by government around the world to reduce the spread of the virus. Uh, in Benin, the measure put in place by the government includes social distancing, mask wearing, school closure, and um, churches uh, closures as well. And more importantly, uh, the, govern the government in Benin established a lockdown for more than eight regions uh, on March 30. 2020, 
so that people inside these regions were not allowed to leave the, the area and people outside the lockdown area were not allowed to enter for at least three months in the lockdown region. So the main question is, uh, uh, is that what is the impact or what is the socioeconomic impact of this measure on, on people in, in Benin? So, uh, to be more specifically in this study, we examine uh, the effect of COVID-19 on economic condition on, of people in Benin. Uh, we look at um, uh, social cohesion as well and trust in, govern in government as well as, well, uh, as, well as uh, intimate partner violence in Benin. So to do that, uh, and because secondary data were not available at this time, what we have done, we conducted a survey and we collected information on various socioeconomic indicators uh, in Benin, uh, including information on individual economic condition, health, willingness to take the vaccine, and intimate partner violence. So we carried out a, a this quantitative this quantitative survey uh, on October 2021. So this is to capture the the, the short term effect of, of government measure on economic or economic uh, and so, social outcomes of people in Benin. So um, the survey covered more than twelve more than more than twelve hundred respondents across the entire regions of Benin. And um, uh, one should keep in mind also that the survey was a face-to-face a -face interview. We were not able to do a phone interview. And so we ran a face-to-face -face interview between respondents and interviewers. And these interviews uh, were during the time of the pandemic. And then it raises uh, the issue of safety -ness and the issue of safety and ethics. So to solve for that, uh, we provided both respondents and interviewers uh, um, with uh, protective equipment, such as face mask and hand sanitizer. Uh, also in during the survey, we face uh, like um, other, other, other challenges and as uh, it's difficult to run a survey or to keep uh, uh, um, to keep up the respondent attention and availability, especially when respondent did not have a good economic condition. So they are more likely they are really reluctant to stay long collaborating with the survey. So uh, another issue also is that it was really difficult to interview women without the presence of their husbands. So uh, this is more likely to, to bias uh, 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 their responses, especially uh, on, on, on questions related to intimate partner violence. So fortunately, to solve for this, we run uh, another type of uh, of analysis called a list experiment analysis. So, um, so ideally for this type of uh, for this type of study or to look at uh, or all the study looking at the impact of an event on so on, on society. So the ideal method in economy uh, is to use a randomized control trials and or a difference in difference analysis where we compare individual uh, affected by the, the disease or the pandemic uh, to the individual uh, 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 who never been affected by the, the pandemic. However, it is difficult to run uh, this type of, of, of experiment or method, uh, especially for the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as the pandemic uh, affected everyone and the government measure also affected everyone in, in, in Benin. So to do that, I'm gonna just like uh, show you uh, a quick descriptive statistic coming from um, our survey in, in Benin. So as a, as a result, what we found, we, um, we asked respondents how they rate their economic condition since the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So as we can see in this graph, the pandemic has worsened the living condition of about 50% uh, of the household, uh, about 44% of, uh, of the respondent re reported an unchanged situation of their living standard, while only 5% of respondents experienced an improvement of their living standard since the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, looking at the data by gender, we observed that women were more likely to be affected economically by the pandemic than men. So especially they were more likely to experience a decline of income and sales since the pandemic. So this is really important because uh, this could have an effect not only on intimate partner violence, but only on child or on children, education and health. So, um, so unfortunately, we didn't like capture the, 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 the measure on, on children in this survey, but uh, one should keep in mind that having a, a, a loss of income within household could have a tremendous uh, effect on, on not only women, but also children. So, um, so what we do find looking at uh, domestic violence, so surprisingly, we, when we ask respondents to compare their experience in domestic violence since COVID-19 to the period before COVID-19, about 42% of the respondents reported that uh, domestic violence decreased and only 6% of the respondents reported an increase of domestic violence since the pandemic. So this result has to be taken with cautious because, because our respondents tend to not answer correctly to this type of sensitive question related to intimate partner violence. So in another study, we run uh, another type of method called this experiment to take in account this, case, this type of bias coming from sensitive question. So, um, so to go quickly, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, another, another question we run on, on vaccine hesitancy and or vaccine willingness um, or willingness to take the COVID-19 vaccine among the Beninese uh, population. So basically uh, for, for, for the pandemic management and the limitation of the spread of the virus, we asked respondents if they were willing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is where before the availability of the, of the vaccine in Benin. So as we can see in this graph, about 54% of respondents were not willing to take the, the, the vaccine. So um, the main question is why this is the case. So uh, we analyze what what are their main reasons for not taking the vaccine? And this is like really important, especially for government uh, to implement policy aiming at reducing the spread of the virus. So, um, so to, exa to examine why a large proportion of individuals is not willing to take the vaccine, we ask respondents to report their level of of confidence in COVID-19 vaccine. So we found that about 40% uh, of the respondents at the time of the survey, they have no confidence at all on COVID-19 vaccine and believe that the vaccine is not safe. So this is a huge issue for policymakers, especially if they want to reduce the spread of the virus. And it is important to know what type of policy government should implement to convince people to take the the vaccine. So, um, so to 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 go like deeply in this uh, in this um, in this question, we ask respondent if they agree that uh, government force people to take the vaccine and if they are willing to do so. If this was the case, so about sixty eight percent don't do not agree that government force people to take the vaccine and more than 50% are willing to take the vaccine if this is mandate or at work or forced by the government. So to sum up and to wrap up this presentation, so, um, so uh, I, I presented like a quick um, analysis we did uh, to help uh, 
government in Benin to, to, to tackle the, the direct effect of the government measure on, on, on socioeconomic uh, outcomes of Beninese uh, population. So what we do find, we found that the pandemic uh, worsened economic uh, condition in, in the entire population of Benin. And in particular, the, the, the effect was large for, for women. And also we find a decrease uh, of intimate partner violence against women during this time. And uh, actually we are running an, on an elite experiment analysis to examine the mechanisms underlying the result on, on domestic violence. So yeah, so I'm gonna uh, stop here and, and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Lucien, for that uh, insightful presentation. I'm sure many people uh, would have questions and uh, probably uh, have the time to answer some of those questions after all the presenters have spoken. So without further ado, colleagues, I would like to now invite um, Professor Robert West, who is Emeritus Professor of Health Psychology at University College London and former participant in the behavioral subgroup of search that advised the Westminster government on the scientific foundations for policy. He is a current member of the behavioral subgroup of independent search. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite you, Robert West, for your presentation. And I'm um, excited to hear what's your thoughts about on this. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I will share my screen. I have a couple of slides too, uh, which I'd like to share with you. And I hope you can see that all right. Um, so what I thought I would do just in the next five minutes or so is to um, explain uh, why and how I think theories are pretty much essential when you're conducting primary research um, in uh, epidemic control, um, as in you know, so many other areas that uh, we deal with in epidemiology. And, um, and, and I want to focus specifically uh, on a model of, of behavior that I think, I think has been quite widely used, was certainly used in the UK and, and some other countries um, to help with this process. So um, let's have a look at the first slide. So um, you, you need theories. I mean, even if you don't think you need theories, you need theories because you're always gonna have a theory. The only question is whether you make it explicit or not. And it's far better in science to make it explicit than to leave it implicit. Um, now, a lot of people then think, well, where am I going to get this theory from? You know, the, the, we all have sort of, sort of, many of us have sort of pet theories, but what, how do we choose such a theory? And that's another topic in itself. But we do need to have an explicit theory and to let people know what it is. We need it to identify the research topics, to see where the gaps are, uh, what it is that we need to know. Uh, we need uh, we very much need a theory to involve, inform the content of our surveys and measures, not just surveys, but any, any kind of measure that we've got, whether it's behavioural or not, it, it'll always have a theory underpinning it, but it, and it's far better when you're constructing measures and instruments of one sort or another to have a very clear idea of what that theory is. Um, and then, of course, to be able to analyse and interpret the results. Now, um, there's just one, uh, I'm just giving you an example of one theory, which is what we use um, as behavioral scientists um, uh, uh, at UCL in, in the group that I work with. This is a model that some of you may have come across. It's quite widely used now um, in, in a number of areas. It's called the COMB model. Um, the idea is, is for the, of this model is very much that it's a transdisciplinary model. It's not a psychological model. It's not a model of individual behavior. Or, or, or collective behavior, it's a model of all behavior, or is intended to be anyway. Um, and that it's transdisciplinary disciplinary in the sense that it's sufficiently broad uh, and the constructs are sufficiently broad that whatever language one might use in anthropology, in sociology, in psychology, in economics, uh, neuroscience, all the other areas that may be relevant, those can be mapped on to these very broad ideas that we're going to be talking about here. 
Um, but also the, the, the language that we try to use is one that, uh, that um, policymakers can understand. We may try to make it as close as possible to the sort of language that people would use in everyday life. And the model has a very simple premise, and it's pretty much on, in, incontrovertible, really. It's not, we didn't make it up. It's been around for thousands of years. And the idea is basically that at any one moment, our behavior has to be a product of three things. And if all, of, if all three of those things aren't present, the behavior won't occur. First of all, the person must have the capability to do it. So I'll just quickly explain what I mean by that in a minute. Secondly, they have to have the opportunity to do it. Their social and physical environment must facilitate or enable it. And thirdly, they must be, and this is slightly different, they must be more motivated to do this thing at this moment than whatever else they might be doing, whatever else they have the opportunity or capability to do. So that the difference between motivation and the other two constructs is that motivation is always a competition. And that will, I hope, resonate with you when you're thinking about your own behavior, because at any one moment, there's lots of things we could be doing, but it's our, our motivational system that prioritizes our behaviors. And that's tremendously important when we're understanding behaviors related to epidemics, because very often, we might be motivated to do certain things that would be a good idea, but we also have competing motivations and sometimes those are stronger. So let's just delve a little bit more into what I mean by capability, uh, because this then helps you to understand how to look at the literature to design your questionnaires and your, your measures and so on, but also to interpret them. For capability, the, uh, the first thing they, is, do they know what they need to do? Do they even know that? And we often assume that they do, but actually they don't. Um, do they know how to do it? And do they understand why at least we think it's important, even if they may not agree with us? At least do they understand what it is that we're trying to get across? But in addition to that, do they have the physical capabilities to do it? Uh, do they have the mental skills to do it? Do they have the, the self-regulatory capacity to do it? Can they, can they do it in the face of you know, very powerful competing impulses and so on? So that's capability. Motivation is around prioritization. Do they even think it's a good idea? Um, uh, is, uh, are they convinced that it's the right thing to do? But of course, that wouldn't necessarily be enough. We also have to understand, does it make them feel good doing it? Because our, our behavior is so much driven by what makes us feel good or bad. And what we think is a good idea is not always necessarily uh, going to get a look in there. Does it meet a, meet a personal need, a need for agency, for example, a need for um, self-realization, a, a need relating to identity or religion or whatever it might be? Does the, does the behavior fit with a person's self-identity? Identity, is, you know, as you all know, is so important in controlling our behaviors. And lastly, but not, uh, not least, is it, can, is it part of their routine? So can we build the behavior into their routine? And then finally, with opportunity, we've got all the sort of practical issues as well as the social issues that come into play. Can they afford it? Do they have the time? Do they have the financial resources and the material resources? Uh, do they have the prompts and the cues to do it? And then, of course, we get to this huge area, fundamentally important, about social networks. Is it part of their culture? Is it normative? Um, is it something that feels right to them within their culture and is supported? And do they have a supportive social network? So when you think about it like that, um, then it sort of it should prompt how you go about uh, or what it is that you decide you're going to measure in the primary research. And then one way of cutting through, it, it, can, it can obviously get complex, uh, but one way of cutting through that complexity is to think about how you would sort of implement uh, a behavioral intervention using that a model like that. And this is just one model, obviously. And one of the things that we've done with the UK government is to produce a simple sort of acronym for them, which is to promote a behavior, you want to make it near, as in the sense of normal, easy, attractive, and routine. And that gives you a sort of starting point for as you're thinking about messaging, if you're a communications company, as you're thinking about built environments, as you're thinking about your, your social rules, norms, legislation, and so on. 
And then the opposite of that is to deter a behavior. It's just the, the opposite of that. Do you want to make it uh, abnormal? So it spells out a far. So abnormal, fraught in the sense of difficult to do, the opposite of easy, aversive. And do you want people, can you get people to be reflective about it in order to stop them doing things that come automatically and emotionally. Uh, and I've left a link down there. I'm sure the slides will be available to you, but I've left a link down there to the, uh, to the publication that uh, that appears in. So um, I'll stop showing there and um, uh, obviously very uh, happy to uh, answer any questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Robert, for that uh, very fascinating talk. I no doubt there will be a, a lot of questions for you in the Q&A session. Um, colleagues, I would now like to invite our last speaker for the day, um, Rashid Ansumana, who is an Associate Professor and Dean of the School of Community Health Sciences of Njala University in Sierra Leone. He has a PhD in tropical medicine from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Rashid has over 80 scientific publication, publications covering topics on infectious diseases, one health research and epidemiology. We are very excited to have you share your perspectives, uh, Rashid. And uh, if you can please share your screen and um, your video as well for people to see you, thanks. Thank you very much, Blessings, for the introduction. And uh, thanks for having me. I'll just share my, my screen. So um, I'm going to present on the, the West African One Health Actions for Understanding, Preventing and Mitigating Outbreaks. But this slide is comprised of thought around the, the session that we are having today and also the uh, the topic uh, in front of us. We recognize that, um, that there has been increased anthropogenic activities, and these ones have increased the possibility for multi-species contact, and has also changed host pathogen dynamics, infection epidemiologies, increasing the risk of zoonosis, and emergence of novel pathogens. So this is the current trend. And uh, of note, we all recognize the occurrence and frequency of zoonotic disease outbreaks is the new normal. So uh, if you check the news, you hear about monkeypox, you hear about different, different other diseases, and most of them are of zoonotic origin. So in general, outbreaks create multifaceted and sometimes complex problems, and they also tend to create economic holes when they occur. But then we recognize the new definition of One Health, which was put forward in December 2021 by the One Health High Level Expert Panel, and they define One Health as an integrated unified approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystem. So the thing they have to take note of is sustainably, sustainably as we go through the slides and as we discuss for the next uh, day or so. Rashid, could I ask yeah. you to put it into presentation mode just so we can see the, the screen a little bit more? Okay, sorry. So we also see that um, when outbreaks occur in places that they occur, normally it starts with a steep learning curve. In many countries, we had in emerging diseases are occurring, there's a steep learning curve. This was evident when we had the uh, Ebola virus disease outbreak in West Africa. When SARS-CoV-2 just emerged, there, of course, everybody was learning. And with that, there was a lot of infodemic. And with that, there was a lot of difficulty in actually responding to it. So some communities are not informed enough to enhance adequate infection prevention and control and other measures that ensure the outbreak is turned early. 
the infodemics that are associated with new disease outbreaks or recurring outbreak necessitate a unified approach for response. And in the midst of this also, we have cultural diversity issues. You may have one outbreak like SARS-CoV-2, but in different countries, this same outbreak is responded to having in mind the cultural context of those countries and what is normal there. In Africa, in some of the remote places of Africa, of course, people not do Google search to find out what is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's no such, but in places like the US, Europe, and other places advanced, you tend to see that if there's a new word, people quickly search and find out what it means with that information, they are at least a bit well informed than people that can't do this. And in some locations also, we do have cultural norms that define outbreak response strategies. For example, when West Africa had the uh, Ebola outbreak, barrier rights are very much, very closely uh, uh, done. It's something that the communities respect and something that they cherish, especially if somebody very close to them dies, they want to give them a bit befitting funeral. But this at the time was not the right approach, especially uh, when people are not yet aware that uh, safe and dignified burial, burial processes should be carried out. And so this created a lot of problems. People still bury their dead, contacting them and getting infected. And in some locations also, you get to see the cultural norms affect health seeking behavior. So you may have females that cannot be touched by a male clinician, for example, or males that cannot be touched by a female clinician, according to the cultures of the people in question. And there are situations also where you have uh, aged people refusing to be treated by very young clinicians. So in the uh, way you put all of this together in an outbreak situation, it makes the problem much more compounded. So now I'll focus on the project I'm talking on also, the West African One Health Actions. So it's a project that has been funded by the IDRC. But stepping back, I'm also a member of the Pandora Consortium. And uh, the, the proposal we put forward to uh, the IDRC was informed by activities also in the Pandora Consortium, where a lot of work has been done on infectious disease surveillance, response to outbreaks, and it likes a very wonderful consortium. So I have to make a very good note of that here. But then these are the study locations for this study. So these are country uh, contact. So the West African World Actions Project is in four countries of West Africa. You have Guinea, represented by Magasuba Mfale. You have Liberia, represented by Julius Deliani. You have uh, Nigeria by Simeon Cadmus uh, in UI, University of Ibadan, and myself from Jala University in Sierra Leone. And the countries selected are countries that are proximal to uh, other West African countries. So for the West African One Actions Project, these are the objectives. First, to ask, assess the relationship between changing demographics, also considering gender equity, land use change, and emerging diseases in West Africa using gender sensitive socioecological systems research. And then, but for this project, the focus is on three diseases, primarily Ebola virus disease, Lassa fever, and COVID-19, and to assess the access to health for humans and animals, environmental health, livestock food security, sociocultural practices, but spread the effect on gender equality, determining innovative approaches to improve gender equality. And then we have the third objective, which is to develop and or improve using gender mainstreaming community action groups for community participatory animal disease surveillance, community participatory human disease surveillance. And then finally, we have a work, uh, an objective for zoo anthroponosis. 
So in short, this slide here gives you an overview of the activities. So if you look at the work package to there, it talks about social ecology, pathogen surveillance and land use change analysis. So you, for example, want to know why is it that in Guinea, in Gegedu area, we always get to see new diseases emerging, outbreaks coming from there. You had the first Ebola outbreak in West Africa coming from there. You had a Mabo coming from there. You had the second outbreak coming from there. Now have uh, avian influenza coming from there. So what is so special about this zone in Guinea? And uh, we do recognize that there has been quite a lot of land use change in, uh, because of um, development strides in these African countries. But with that also comes the possibility for what? For emergence of diseases and, and with this also comes complications. So understanding land use analysis and how that relates with uh, emergence of diseases or how that contributes to outbreaks is very much interesting uh, at this stage. And then in the work package three, which is uh, reverse zoonosis, when humans have infections, they tend to also give to their friends, the dogs or the cat. So we want to know how this one happens or whether it is happening and to relate such things clearly. Then the work package for their community action networking. So in these communities in Africa, there's quite a lot of poverty, but communities as it was shown in Sierra Leone during the SARS-CoV-2 uh, outbreak, the communities are very, despite not being highly educated for some, uh, but they are very much resilient and they are very much informed as well. So people in Australia learned from the Ebola outbreak. Some of the things they learned, they learned social distancing, they learned uh, hand hygiene, they learned uh, the introduction of community uh, bylaws, bylaws in communities uh, who should come into the community, when a stranger comes, which kind of approach they should use. And uh, those bylaws were there for the Ebola outbreak and then came COVID. So those things were just activated and uh, there was a chain of command where in you have information flowing right from the community up to the presidency of the country and then from the presidency down to the communities. And so this flow of information helped in a lot of way to ensure that, you know, the outbreak did not actually deal with us like it could have done. And so communities are very critical. So the community action network is where community resilience takes place. And in this case, we um, form community action groups in specific locations across border towns. And these community groups are having WhatsApp groups that have been created or are being created because this is an ongoing work. And, and uh, the, the chats in the community chat rooms are harvested by an AI architecture, an AI dashboard, where uh, keywords are being processed, natural language process is done, and it also will be a sort of early warning system. And then of course, we can't do this without having good policies coming from such work. So there's a policy work package. And then gender is very key because we really need radical inclusion of gender in all walks of life these days. So you see here the one health wheel of change. So in the one health wheel of change, you can see um, uh, the flow of information from community action networks. You have study of ecosystem of changing demographic and other sociological variables. You have pathogen surveillance and reverse diagnosis, remote sensing. All of these come with the data. And then you have the geographical information system is here, artificial intelligence. So this inflow uh, get, gives us data. And the data now leads to policy briefs at regional and federal and community level. You have enhanced one health participatory action at community levels. They have better knowledge of uh, prevention and mitigating of outbreaks. So this project, of course, 
UI is Ingrove University of Ibadan. So this is just a view graph of it being launched there and then in, in Guinea as well. So overall, to just give a summary, so uh, yes, research can be done during outbreaks and one health research is very much necessary these days for outbreak response and there's need for involvement of very remote communities in decision making. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Rashid, for that talk. That was quite interesting. Um, colleagues, we have heard from Trace um, and I'm cognizant of the fact that we, we have run way beyond time. We're supposed to conclude at five. But I'm curious to just take one or two questions from the chat um, and, and ask our panelists maybe to just make their remarks around those quam questions that came through the chat. Um, perhaps I'll start off um, with Lucien. Um, there, was, there was a question around um, why the incidence of violence seems to have decreased during the COVID pandemic. Um, um, would you want to maybe just answer that question, please, if you can? Oh, yeah, uh, interesting question. So, um, so actually, um, the result I presented was uh, descriptive statistics. And so ideally, um, the ideal uh, method to analyze uh, domestic violence is the least experiment analysis. Uh, this is mainly because uh, during the time of the interview, most of women were uh, basically, uh, um, re they responded to the interview in presence of their husband. So um, it is more likely that uh, the, the, the answer we capture from this interview at this time uh, uh, was like uh, biased because they, they, they were reluctant to say that they experienced domestic violence uh, um, in front of their husband. So, um, but we are still running another type of, uh, of uh, survey that we call list experiment analysis. So we, we, we give like bunch of question, um, including domestic violence and we ask, um, we ask women uh, how how many how many events they experienced during the COVID nineteen. However, even with even with this type of of, of, of method, we with our our first analysis showed that there is no effect of COVID nineteen on domestic violence. So um, yeah, so it seems like for all that for some part of uh, country in Africa and. Uh, the pandemic has not affected much people in this for the short term. I mean, like um, another question. Uh, okay, so to sum up and to wrap up, so we conducted this uh, study in in common in collaboration with uh, the National Institute of Statistics and Demography in Benin. So uh, this is like a really reliable. Uh, data and, and methodology. So yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Now thanks, thanks for that comment. Um, um, that's 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 very helpful. Um, I mean, I would love to probe more questions, but because of time, I, unfortunately, I want to move on to um, Robert and just ask a question that came through for you, Robert, specifically in the in the in the chat. So someone was wanting to know. Um, that your behavior model that you, you presented, they seem to have missed certain aspects. So for example, social determinants, historical dimensions. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts? What are your reflections about that? Do you have any comments on that, please? Yeah, no, I'm really glad that um, uh, the, the person raised that because uh, uh, that's certainly not the intention. Um, uh, obviously, in such a short presentation, it's very hard to um, give a full sort of flavor for the model, um, but absolutely crucial in the model are, um, uh, is this thing we, we call opportunity. But opportunity, you know, think of opportunity as incredibly broad, 
including societal factors um, and indeed commercial factors. I mean, one of the things that, you know, it, we talk about the social determinants of health, but the commercial determinants of health, and we see that all around the world, uh, that, you know, are, are tremendously important. So, so uh, and how historical factors lead you up to where you are today, that you need uh, to have those in order to be able to understand it. So I was, I'm really glad that the person raised that. He's absolutely right. All right, all right. Now that's that's interesting. Um, I'm I'm just trying to browse through the chat, um, um, Rashid, and see if there was a specific question that came through for you. Um, but I think from from my side, I'll just be curious to know. So you you did touch on how the sort of one health actions um, were applied, particularly for the West African um, um, Ebola outbreak, and I'm wondering what were some of the lessons um uh, perhaps challenges as well and um limitations that could have been applied during the west african outbreak for the um covid 19 pandemic in africa in general without focusing only on the west african region but on the continent as an overall thank you very much for the question so um you know in africa institutional memory is normally a problem so it's difficult to transition from one outbreak and successfully uh, deal with another outbreak using the lessons learned from the previous one. So, and uh, there are a lot of challenges there. So I think uh, what African government should do, we now have the African CDC, is to have this uh, one health focus in looking at things and actually ensuring that uh, lessons in one part of the continent are, are learned by other parts of the continent using African uh, Union or CDC, which is common to all of us. Of course, there's also the African peer review mechanism, which has been involved in some of these activities. But uh, in terms of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, so um, there was quite, at first it was difficult, it was gruesome, you know, it, it was serious. But then after the outbreak, a lot of lessons have been learned. So then comes COVID and some of the practices used during the Ebola outbreak became very important. In one focus group that we engaged earlier, somebody said in layman's terms that Ebola provided the vaccines for COVID-19. What a person meant, a community member in a focus group in Kenema, a, a town, one of the towns in Sierra Leone, was that some of the practices we utilized during the Ebola outbreak became useful to deal with COVID. And so that is why when even the USA was struggling with COVID, Sierra Leone was very much uh, dealing with it very nicely. Thank you very much. Right. Um, thanks. Thanks for that response, Rashid. Colleagues, um, you know, with these types of conferences and web webinars, you know, we can talk and discuss and um, for hours and hours and hours. But unfortunately, we are limited by time. We are way beyond five o'clock. Um, so I'd like to, on that note, um, conclude this session and um, hand over back to Sarah, I think, for the final concluding remarks. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for your participation in this uh, session. I hope it was quite interesting and very insightful for all of you. Thank you so much. Thank Over you. to you, Sarah. Thank you. Blessing. Yes, I'd like to echo those um, comments. And um, really, without um, delaying proceedings um, too much further, just to remind you you know, to, to come back tomorrow. Um, we'll have um, much more on offer um, tomorrow, as you'll have seen from the agenda. Um, the link to the um, expression of interest for um, future participation in interviews and the survey will um, appear again in the chat um, should you want to um, take them up um, later on today, if you haven't done so already. And I think the, the last word must be given to Elvis, if you're connected from the African CDC. I guess what Elvis wasn't here earlier, I think he might have to drop off. 
Yeah, yes, I, I knew that he'd um, got a meeting earlier. He's clearly been unavoidably detained by some important business. <laughs> so, um, well, then on, on that note, um, yes, yeah, so I won't sum up um, all of the material we've covered and all of the thoughts we've covered um, today, but we'll have a chance to do that tomorrow and a chance for um, more interactive activities. Um, do let us know if you've had problems with Mentimeter. It would be very useful to know that before the dedicated sort of hour and a half long session we've got um, for this sort of work um, tomorrow. So thank you very much indeed. And I wish you good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you are. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.